comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's comic weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Pleasure surprise. Why, little Miss Honey. You promised a very special, special surprise for everybody today. <laughs> That's right, I did, I did. Then quick, please, quick, where is it? Well, oh, listen. That. Don't you know? Did I? Oh, you shouldn't have said that. Why? You made her angry. Uh-oh. What now? She said she's not angry. Good. She is furious. Furious? And that's angry times 32. Oh, excuse me, Tink. 33. You said Tink. Oh, oh, that's not Tinker Bell from Peter Pan. It is indeed. Oh, what did she say? She said it's about time. Well, I'm sorry if I've hurt her feelings, but really, I didn't expect such a wonderful surprise. Oh, there, Tink. That should make you happy. Tink, did you hear? What did she say? She says, it's Boo Jinkle. What's Boo Jinkle? That's fairy talk for okay. Oh, thank you, Tink. I think you're Boo Jinkle, too. <laughs> well, now let me tell you why Tinkerbell is here. Shall I, Tink? All right, Walt Disney has just finished making a moving picture of Peter Pan. Wonderful. What did she say now? She said it's her scrumptic. What's that? Fairy talk for the very best. Oh, her scrumptic. Mm -hmm. Yes, I am, Tink. Tink wants me to tell you, too, that beginning next week, the Comic Weekly will carry the story of Peter Pan in Walt Disney's wonderful color drawing. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, her scrumptic. <laughs> yes, I thought you'd think so. Oh, he is, Tink? Boo Jinkle, I'll tell her. Tell me what. Oh, you'll love this. A special guest is here. Who? Well, who would you like most to see? Peter Pan himself. Well, he's here. He is? Yes, you bet he is. Who? Or should I say, the fellow who plays Peter Pan in Walt Disney's movie. Tell me quick, who is it? No one else but Bobby Driscoll. Oh, he's wonderful. I mean, too scrumpty. Where is he? Turn your eyes and look, Miss Honey. I've lost my shadow, and that's not funny. What? Again? Yep, again. And I want you to help me find him. I'll be glad to, but where shall I look? Look next week in the Comic Weekly. It's tucked away in it. Quite neat. Oh, I'll be sure to look. And Captain Hook, will he be there too? Hook, that sneerfacious old mm -hmm. pirate. Mm -hmm. You never know where he might be. Quite right, Miss Honey. You never know where I might be. Oh, no. The crocodile who ate my arm. Smee, help me. Save me. Smee, where are you, Smee? <laughs> there he goes, a cowardly old frump. I'm not a frump. Well, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of him. Ooh, he is fierce. That crocodile came just in time. That's his principal virtue. And will we see him in the comics, too? You bet you will, Miss Honey. Hooks me and his cutthroat crew. And the crocodile, too? And the crocodile, too. Boo Jinkle, Tink. A and Tinkerbell, too. Well, that should make everyone happy. And it's ter scrumptic of you, Bobby, to come and tell us about it. I've already seen a preview of the picture. It's wonderful. And you, as Peter Pan, should be very proud of yourself. Well, thank you, and I know you'll all love Peter Pan when you see him in the comics in Walt Disney's wonderful colors. And I'll be listening to you, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, every Sunday. Well, thank you, Bobby Driscoll. Bull Jinkle, Tink. Tink says it's time to go. We'll never get to Never Never Land by nightfall. Well, so long. See you in the funny papers. So long, Bobby. Goodbye, Bobby, and thanks for coming. Well, what do you say now? Oh, that was the most wonderful surprise <laughs> in the world. I just can't wait till next week to read Peter Pan and the Funny. Neither can I. Now, would you please read today's funny? Puck the Comic Weekly? Mm -hmm. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page one, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Toot me a toot and tweet me a tweedle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. (laughs) 
Today, Beetle is busy painting pipes and garbage cans and so forth on the army post where he's stationed. And we find him on top of the sergeant's headquarters painting away. I just have to paint these pipes on the roof and I'm through. At that moment, somebody walks by the building and says, Now, who left this ladder here? He takes the ladder and carries it away. A second later, the sergeant comes around the corner. He sees Beetle's jacket spattered with red paint lying on the ground. He exclaims, Hey, what's that? A jacket with blood on it. He picks it up and hurries into his headquarters. And looking at the jacket, he exclaims, Why, it has Bailey's serial number on it. I wonder if something has happened to him. At that moment, on top of the roof, Beetle exclaims, Darn it, somebody took away my ladder. How am I going to get down? Oh, I know. I'll call down this pipe. Maybe somebody will hear me. Hello down there. Last picture, top row. The sergeant in his office hears Beetle's voice come out of the sink. Hello down there. Huh? Who's that? First picture, bottom row from the sink come the words. This is Beetle. The sergeant trembles in fear. Bailey, where are you? From the sink comes the voice. I'm up the bump. Will you get me a ladder? The sergeant, so horrified, his cap pops off. You're up above! At that moment, an officer in the next room, hearing the sergeant talking to himself, steps into the doorway and says, Sergeant, who are you talking to? I'm talking to Bailey's ghost. Uh, Say something to the Captain Beetle. But there's no answer. I said, say something. The officer looks at the sergeant and shakes his head. At that moment, last picture, Beetle appears in the door. Never mind, Sarge. I slid down the drain pipe. The sergeant leaps into the officer's arms. Bailey! (laughs) The officer looks at the jittery sergeant and says, I knew it was just a matter of time till he cracked up. (laughs) (laughs) That was funny. The sergeant thought he was hearing Beetle's ghost when the voice came out of the sink. Yes, especially (laughs) since he'd seen Beetle's jacket with paint on it, and he thought for sure it was blood, and that Beetle had been killed and was up above in heaven. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. And he's some character. Yes, he's some character. Now let's turn over to page three and Prince Val. Oh, yes, I'm anxious to read Val because a very mysterious thing happened to Val last week. A very mysterious thing indeed. He was in the cave of the Druid priest, who was a believer of a religion in the olden times. And he didn't like it because Val had become a Christian. So he gave Val a drink of some kind and told Val to look into the heavens. And then the druid priest chanted some strange words. And all of a sudden, the sky was filled with strange gods. Do you think that they really appeared? Well, let's read now and find what Val thinks of this. Here we go with Prince Val and the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Dray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. (laughs) The sun slides behind the distant hills and the chanting of the druid ceases. Prince Valiant, half blind from the glaring rays, his head still spinning from the potent nectar, gazes in drug bewilderment at the empty sky. Has he really seen the gods of old in all their glory go thundering across the heavens? He looks back at his companion's last picture top roll. Tor stands white-faced and shaken in superstitious fear. But Helgi, that fat and jolly cynic, closes one eye in a wink and mutters something that sounds like hocus pocus. Next morning, Val and his friends say farewell to the priest and go on their way, first picture, second row. As he walks along, Val laughs as he remembers how Morgan Le Fay, the sorceress that played the same trick on him long ago, and how wise Merlin explained how it was done. The drink the priest had given Val had made him groggy. And when Val looked into the sun, his eyes were blinded. And whatever the priest made Val think of, Val saw in the sun. All day they traveled. That evening, last picture, second row, they come to a valley where a neat village seems to offer comfort for the coming night. But first picture, bottom row, when they enter... There was no warm welcome, only the chill feeling of hate and distrust. An armed man approaches them. Which side are you on? The gods of old 
Or the foreign god? Val answers slowly. Well, we're strangers here and know not your problem. We stay in the middle of the road. Val says this to make sure that the man doesn't think he's taking sides. This way, Val is sure he'll have an opportunity to visit the village and find out if there is any trouble here. So wrapped in their cloaks, last picture, Val and his friends settle down under a tree for the night in the village square. From an ancient temple comes the chanting of a druid, while psalms are being sung in a newly built Christian chapel. Why, that looks like two churches there in that village. Yes, one is the newly built chapel of the Christians, which is the new religion that the missionaries brought into Val's kingdom. And the other one is the Druids, which is an old religion like the priests which Val just visited. Is that right? That's right. And the old Druids are angry that the new religion is being brought into their kingdom. But they don't like the new church, do they? No. And Val is trying to find out who the troublemakers are that have been killing the missionaries and the believers in the new religion. I wonder if he'll find out here in this village. Well, maybe we'll find out next week. Now I'll bet you'd like to see what's happening in Dick's adventure. Oh, I would. Then let's turn over the page to the last page of the first section. And on the last page of the first section is Dick's adventures. Yep, Dick's adventures. And Dick is in the early days of America when the English and the Americans were at war with each other. And Dick was captured by the British, and he's a prisoner on one of their ships. And the British have also captured a young Baltimore lawyer by the name of Francis Scott Key. And he's a prisoner on the same ship that Dick is. And the British are planning to attack the town of Baltimore. I wonder if they really do attack Well, it. let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Dick and his friends know that the surprise attack on Baltimore is to take place. They'd hoped they'd find some way to warn the Americans. But the opportunity doesn't come. And first picture, second row. Dick and his friends are forced to watch the attack on the American city begin at dawn. The British ships pound away at Fort McHenry, the last point of defense guarding the town of Baltimore. If it falls, the city will fall and be captured by the British. Dick turns to Francis Scott Key. Oh, can Fort McHenry hold out? Key replies... We'll know as long as our flag keeps flying. Dusk follows daylight, then turns into night, and still the merciless bombardment continues. In the glare of the light of the explosions, Dick sees the flag still flying. Then, last picture, second row, Dick sees Francis Scott Key writing furiously on scraps of paper. Dick looks over Key's shoulder, and first picture, bottom row, sees these words. Whose broad stripes and bright stars, through the perilous fight, by the ramparts we watched. Dick looks up in the glare of another explosion and sees the flag is still there. He looks back at the piece of paper that Key is scribbling on, and he sees another sentence take shape. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night... Dick shouts. They never got past Fort McHenry to Baltimore. They never got past. They never got past. And then Dick looks around. Last picture and sees he's in his own room, in his own home, in the world of today. And he exclaims, Gee, I just dreamed I was with Francis Scott Key when he wrote the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> That's when and that's how it happened. Francis Scott Key saw the battle and he wrote the poem. Just like that. He saw the battle and wrote the poem. He was a genius, wasn't he? Yes. And later somebody put music to it and then we made it our national anthem, our country song. Oh, that was a wonderful story. I'm glad to have learned that. I thought you'd be. Well, now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. I want to read that. Well, I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly, 
And on the last page of the first section, Rusty Riley. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Rusty Riley had become frightened by a phone call from Mr. Miles to Tex. Knowing that it would mean trouble for him, he has decided to run away. He has hidden in one of the trucks that's moving Denver Dooley's carnival from one town to another. Rusty's friend Stovepipe discovered Rusty in the truck and has befriended Rusty by slipping him a couple of hamburgers and saying nothing to the driver about Rusty being there. They're now in Brownsdale, where the carnival is setting up for the next show. Last picture, top row... Stovepipe and Rusty are talking. Now look, Rusty, my boy. I don't know what you're up to, but if you're in trouble with the police... Oh, no, Mr. Stovepipe, I haven't done anything wrong. It's not that kind of trouble. Rusty goes on, first picture, bottom row. It's my Uncle Rufus. He's trying to get me to help him get a lot of money from Mr. Miles. You see, he's my only living relative, and he says if I don't help him, he'll take me away. Ah, yes. I think I see your predicament. But, my dear lad... How do you expect to live? Well, well, I thought maybe I could get a job with Mr. Dooley's carnival. Oh, my boy. Denver Dooley is very hard-boiled about boys who run away. But perhaps I can soften him up a bit when I tell him about your very touching and unselfish act in the matter of Mrs. Jones. Meanwhile, there's a shack over beyond those trees. You and your dog, Flip, go get some sleep. Okay, Mr. Stovepipe. And thanks. Meanwhile, on the other side of the grove, two suspicious-looking men are talking. Now, listen, Specs, I know you're plenty sore at Dooley, but are you sure you want to go through with this? Listen, are you kidding? I've been waiting two years for him to bring his Connie to Brownsdale. Come on over to that shack, and I'll tell you just what to do. to the same shack the stovepipe told Rusty to go to, aren't they? I believe they are. Well, it sounds like they're planning something evil against Denver Dooley. Yes, it does. Well, if Rusty's going to be in that shack, maybe he will hear what they're planning, and then he'll tell Mr. Dooley in time for Mr. Dooley to spoil their plans. Well, then surely Mr. Dooley would be nice to Rusty and let him stay with the carnival. Well, let's hope so. We'll find out more about that next week. Now let's pick up the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. Oh, yes, because I know we'll find Dagbit and Blondie on the first page. And you're right. Here they are. What silly thing does Dagwood do today? <laughs> we'll find out right now. Here we go on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly with Dagwood and Blondie. ram a foo ram a fum zim zam zabby Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood is sick in bed. His neighbor, Herb Woodley, has come to the Bumstead house bearing a kettle of chicken soup that Mrs. Woodley had cooked for Dagwood. Last picture, top row, Blondie comes into Dagwood's bedroom and says, Dagwood, look at the delicious pot of chicken soup Mrs. Woodley sent over. And Dagwood answers, Mm. First picture, second row, from downstairs, there comes a shout. Mama! Oh, oh, that's right. I've got water boiling down on the stove. So she sets the kettle of soup on the floor beside the bed and trots downstairs. Cookie asks, Is there enough soup for us too, Mama? Oh, yes, she sent plenty for all of us. She trots to the kitchen, last picture, second row, and begins to put some mustard into some hot water that's in a kettle on the stove. May we have our soup now, Mama? Yes, but first I have to take care of Daddy. First picture, third row, Blondie brings the kettle of hot mustard water into Dagwood's bedroom and sets it down on the floor beside the kettle of soup. Here's your hot mustard foot bath, dear, to take away your chill. Oh, will you get me a large bath towel? Blondie goes to the closet to get Dagwood a bath towel. Alexander asks, Hey, do we get the soup now, Mom? Yes, dear. I'll take Daddy the towel and bring down the soup. Last picture, third row. The children are at the table, and Blondie has served them soup from the kettle, which she brought down from Dagwood's bedroom. Alexander takes a big sip. Ah! 
Cookie exclaims, Hey, this soup is terrible. What? She picks up the kettle and dashes upstairs. <laughs> and second picture, bottom row, finds Dagwood sitting on the bed with his feet in the kettle of hot liquid. And Dagwood says, Hmm, his hot foot math is wonderful. And last picture, Blondie exclaims, It should be. It's Mrs. Woodley's chicken soup. And Dagwood goes... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that crazy Dagwood putting his feet in the soup. <laughs> yes, this is one time when you could say that Dagwood was really in the soup. <laughs> oh, that's very funny. Feet in the soup. <laughs> yes. Well, I think Blondie should have been sensible enough not to trust Dagwood by putting those kettles right beside each other on the floor because Dagwood is so bleary-eyed he couldn't tell which was which. And the kettles did look exactly and alike. And I guess that's why Blondie took the kettle that Dagwood didn't have his feet in. <laughs> yes, I guess so. Well, now let's see what happens to Robin Hood. I wonder if he will marry the maid Marion today. Well, let's turn over the page now to find out. And look, there's Robin Hood on the very next page. Last week was thrilling when King Richard came back and heard how Robin had been loyal to him, and he made Robin a knight. That's right. He dubbed Robin Earl of Loxley, which was a very important title in those days. And now Robin's troubles are over, aren't they? Yes, they are. Now let's see if Robin marries the Maid Mary in the way you're wondering. Here we go with the story of Robin Hood. It's Merry Merry England in days long ago. Time now for Robin Hood. So music, hi-ho! <laughs> King Richard had returned to England, discovered the treachery of his brother Prince John and the Sheriff of Nottingham, and had punished them. And King Richard has then searched out Robin Hood and shown him his gratitude for the brave deeds that Robin had performed to help secure the king's freedom. And now in Sherwood Forest, King Richard stands before Robin, who is kneeling before him. And knighting Robin, the king says, Now rise, Sir Robin, Earl of Loxley. And then King Richard sees the Maid Marian come forward from the little hut. And he exclaims, By the bones of St. Edward, another outlaw. Marian quickly asks if King Richard can give her any news of her father, who had gone with King Richard on his crusade. Last picture, top row, King Richard smiles. Your father awaits you at Huntington, where you are to marry the Earl of Loxley. A look of astonishment comes over Marion's face as she says to herself, Marry the Earl of... Then first picture, bottom row, she turns to Robin and asks him if he has nothing to say about whom she's to marry. And Robin answers, Well, who am I to question the dictates of my sovereign king? And King Richard chuckles... Well said, my Earl of Loxley. And then, realizing that Robin is the Earl of Loxley, Marion throws her arms around him, exclaiming, My Earl of Loxley. <laughs> and last picture, as Robin's outlaws laugh with joy, the young lovers kiss. And so our story ends. England was merry again. The outlaw band returned to peaceful pursuits, and Robin and Maid Marion became one. <laughs> That is the end, except that they lived happily ever after. Oh, I love they lived happily ever after stories, and I especially love the story of Robin Hood. It was wonderful. Well, don't forget, in the same spot next week, another of these wonderful Walt Disney stories begins, and that one will be Peter Pan. Well, I certainly won't forget that. Now look across the page. There's Roy Rogers. Yes, and last week, remember, Roy discovered a girl in the outlaw's hideout, and she led Roy into some tunnels in the hideout. That's right, and down in the tunnels, they found the girl's father locked in a dungeon. But the outlaws have discovered that two of their men are dead, and that now Roy has escaped. I wonder if Roy will get out of there before the outlaws catch him. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. A yip by you. Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip by you. <laughs> Down in the tunnel, Mr. Fargo's dog comes toward Brimstone. Roy shouts, Careful, Brimstone! Mr. Fargo quickly drops a rope over the dog and pulls him away from Brimstone, saying, Lucky you didn't touch Butcher's collar. Those spikes contain a poison I devised to destroy the outlaws who tricked me into working for them. Come here, Butch, come here. Roy now knows the secret of how the dog had killed the outlaw. Quickly, they make plans. The girl is to smuggle her father out of the mission and take him home. Before they leave, Mr. Fargo points out some steps that lead to a secret panel in the Sphinx's office. And last picture, top row, Roy and Brimstone mount the steps and open the panel that leads to the Sphinx's office. 
They hear a voice saying, well, I hope my boys capture the two lawmen. Only they could be responsible for the strange deaths. Roy and Brimstone step into the office, first pick to bottom row. The Sphinx whirls around, sees Roy, has the drop on him, and exclaims, The law dogs! And you know my secret, Blaster? Brimstone chortles, Holy smoke! The Sphinx was talking to himself. No wonder he never talks in front of his men. He's got a baby voice. <laughs> hey, Roy. Roy, I hear the gang coming back. The Sphinx makes a break to escape. Roy grabs him. No, no, you're not going any place. The Sphinx holds up his hands in resignation, saying, For years I've carried a sheriff's slug in my throat. That's why I hate all peace officers. Roy says, Never mind your life story. Now, this gun will be on you every second I'm behind this screen. Don't you try warning your men. <laughs> Quickly, Roy and Brimstone hide behind the screen. A second later, the Sphinx's men come in. Last picture, one of them sees the Sphinx is mussed up and asks, Hey, what happened to you, Sphinx? The Sphinx makes a few quick gestures, and Gusty, another outlaw, says to himself, Uh-oh. The boss is telling me that somebody with a gun is behind that screen. Oh, Roy forgot that the Sphinx does all of his talking by sign language. Yes, and now the outlaws know that Roy is hiding there. Good heavens, what will happen to Roy? Well, we'll find that out next week. Now, don't forget to tell all of your friends to listen next week when we begin reading Walt Disney's Peter Pan. Oh, I'll be sure to tell everybody. And now let's wish everybody... Happy New, New Year. Year! That's all the time I have, but before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Connie Quigley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>